Hello everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Phil and this is Designing the New Usual, Sparking Sustainable Moment, uh, Movements, a broadcast partnership between Design It and the Index Project, live from Blocks in Copenhagen, Denmark. Now, Sparking Sustainable Movements, there's two words in there that we're particularly keen to unpack in the next hour or so, sustainable or sustainability and movements. It's been said that when it comes to sustainability, the focus for businesses is on inward change, CSR and the value that brings, of course. But what about outward change too? What if the new usual for creating sustainability was about sparking movements around businesses, inward and outward? You could also be forgiven for thinking sustainability was about reducing with emissions and temperatures and all the important things there. But it's also about increasing and education, equality, rights are all something we want to increase. And that, that's something the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals set out, that duality they set out quite clearly. You could take that further a little bit and say there's a duality in the approach you take as well. Are you proactive or are you reactive? Is your glass half full or is it half empty? Um, it's all too easy to bash what's not being done, um, but today I can tell you that we are glass half full people. Um, what can be done to start a movement around sustainability will be our focus. My and your curiosity won't be going solo, I'm grateful to say. Thankfully we're joined by guests in the studio and on video um, who are also glass half full people, already innovating on sustainability in sports, in med tech, in packaging, social justice, and textile innovation. That's quite the mix. First up, let me introduce the panel. First up is Michael Michelson. Uh, Michael is commercial manager and sustainability lead at packaging company and Index Award 2021 finalist Paboco. Working with reshaping and rethinking collaboration, he engages global partners to make Paboco the world's first 100% bio-based and recyclable paper bottle. Paboco works with global partners like Coca-Cola and L'Oreal, if you didn't know, and is really a drive for creating change. Uh, also joining Michael is Nasera Ahmed, uh, Senior Director of Sustainability at Global Health Innovator Coloplast. With over 13 years of experience in strategy and business integration of sustainability, Nazira knows how to walk the walk, you could say. Working across the globe and within different industries, she's passionately working towards a future of circular economy, climate action and equal opportunity. We also have a third panellist with us who's not quite here yet, is racing from the train, that's Anna Jensen. So I'll do a little introduction later when Anna joins us as well. Uh, also joining us via recorded video uh, will be Kerry Huang, who's the Chief of Staff to Pangaea's Brand and Impact SVP, and Wail Ashawaf, who is the CEO and co-founder of Civil Rights App Rights. Plus, there'll be some shared thoughts from our own people at the Index Project and Design It as well to add into there. You, no doubt, have some questions and comments to add as well, and we'd love if you could share as you go along. Um, we're bringing a somewhat Danish perspective to things, or a Scandinavian perspective, because this is from Denmark, but we have some global contributors as well, and we would love you to contribute as well. So please do. Uh, you can do that in the, uh, in the chat next to the video stream, and uh, we've got some of the team who will be picking up your thoughts there and passing them on to us. Um, honestly, we'd love to hear from you, so please do. Don't hold back. Um, right, so one of the many threads that links our guests today is not only a sustainable mindset, but and not only recognising the importance of partnerships and, and community in building that sustainable mindset, but also having the ambition to actually do something about it. And do and doing seem to be some important words here, taking action if you like. And action is probably what we need right now, both in sustainability but also in this broadcast. So we'll get moving, there's a lot to cram in. And we'll start by framing some of the challenges that we're facing from, uh, from a handful of my own colleagues at Design It actually, who are going to share some thoughts on sustainability from their perspective. <laughs> 
it's a response to the negative impact that our way of life is having on the health of our planet. It's not looking too good, uh, so it's really an existential type of problem. As designers, I see an important role in asking good questions. And maybe the first question we need to ask is, what future should we prepare for? Because the way that we've built the global economy and historically measured business success has led to the over-exploitation and depletion of those natural resources, as well as generation of an increasing amount of waste and environmental pollution. We also see companies and organizations that want to tap into this agenda. And this is great news, the more the merrier. We need uh, to all of us involved to make the change need needed. However, it also offers some opportunities and challenges when it comes to how we communicate as companies and organizations. First and foremost, we need to uh, build the foundation. We need to be specific about what do we talk about when we talk about sustainability. On a personal level, it means considering the things that we buy or invest in, the spaces that we live and work in, how we move around, what we eat, the energy that we use and the things that we throw away. That's because what we do as individuals, but especially what we do as parts of communities, uh, shapes behaviors influences decision-making, influences policy creation, and keeps companies accountable. It also uh, accelerates and rewards those taking action. So it can be super tricky for consumers to navigate what are actually sustainable choices uh, and what are the actual actions. So when a company says that they are focused on sustainability, how much and what are the actions that they're doing? So by using communication, we can sort of spread the word and we can inspire and we can also create a preference towards our brand um, or product or offering um, by showcasing what are the actions that we do in an honest and transparent way. We need to be both optimistic and realistic, which can be hard. Uh, also, the climate crisis as a whole is a shitty story. Literally speaking, uh, it's hyper complex, it's abstract, it's difficult to understand, feels distant. Um, so there's so much to be done just to make that more relatable. Um, and in addition to asking good questions, I think that should be a key focus area for us as a design community of, of thinkers and doers. Um, we need to dare to experiment. We need to dare to think differently. And what study shows is that consumers are not expecting companies and organizations to be perfect, but they expect them to be honest. And when they find that, um, that they're greenwashing, brands and companies are, are really being punished by consumers. So it's about creating a transparency and honest and, and talk about the flaws and challenges ahead can be a strength in the communication for companies. The SDGs has been a super important framework uh, in this context, but we also need to figure out how we can facilitate the right types of projects, um, partnerships and uh, types of collaborations um, that cuts across silos, disciplines, because no one really can tackle this and move ahead in isolation. You shouldn't be cynical about the impact of our actions, of our role as parts of communities. It is a great source of hope and optimism. A feast of interesting points to, uh, to tuck into on this broadcast. But before we do, I'd like to hand over to Nasera Ahmed, who will share her perspective on Coloplast's sustainability journey. out here as well. Um, so I will try and present what does that mean when I say sustainable growth leadership. So first and foremost, if I have to really just talk about Coloplast itself, I mean, we've been a company since 1957. We are a medical device company, and we make medical devices for people that have very intimate healthcare needs. So 
you could say for ostomy reasons, continence, wound and skin care, uh, intervention urology. And we are a global company, so we are actually based out of almost 41 countries, so in all many various different markets. But the slide that I have up over here is really going to talk about the people that we work for. We are around 13 to 14,000 employees in the company, and all of us are actually working for these users that you see on the screen. I, I actually have to just say, I've been at Coloplast for about a year now, and um, I have started to understand what the business is, uh, the kind of medical, you know, these products that we're actually working with. One of them happens to be a catheter that I, you know, had a chance to just play with and look around. And I realized, I was told, I need to sort of use this catheter or try and work this catheter through a silicone uh, tube just using two fingers. And I think I failed miserably. And that's because if I didn't do that, there is a huge risk of infection. I use this almost go through... Uh, almost two and a half times, uh, uh, you know, urinary tract infections uh, over, the, over the course of one year. And many of them are also really worried about leakage. Those who have sort of bowel uh, symptoms and things like that, or who have a stoma, they worry about uh, leakage. And I think what all of that leads to is anxiety. Uh, I would be, I've been listening to uh, some of our users, and they really have talked about how sometimes they don't leave their homes because they think they will have this kind of a problem and then, you know, it'll be so embarrassing. And I think over this year, I've really understood what it is that these products are actually catering for. It's these users who have a medical condition. They can't live without these kind of products. And yet, as a company, we want to do something to make sustainability easy for them. And that's why I would say in the last one year, uh, we launched our strategy a year ago. It's called Strive 25, uh, Sustainable Growth Leadership. What does that mean? It means we want to be a growing company. We want to cater for more users. But at the same time, we want to do it in a sustainable way. And that's why, if you see in that slide, sustainability is a key element of our 2025 strategy. It is one of the key enterprise themes as well. What it means by, let's say, having sustainability as part of the, the strategy is the governance of this has changed. We have our top management. So actually, our executive leadership team is the Sustainability Steering Committee. We have established a new, you could say, unit. We used to have, uh, I mean, Coloplast has been working with environmental improvements and sustainability. Uh, actually, you used the word, uh, Phil, CSR, for quite many years. Um, but now it's a lot more. So this duality that you talk about, you know, creating inward change and outward change. Uh, and at the same time, as I go along, I can talk about how we're working towards increasing certain things and reducing some things. So this is what our strategy is about. Um, the focus of these five years is, of course, environmental improvements of our products and also our production. So that is the key part. It is living up to our mission, which is to make life easier for people that have intimate healthcare needs. And we have focused, you could say, on two priority areas. We want to improve our products and our packaging, and we want to uh, reduce emissions. So climate action is also very important for the company. And that doesn't mean that there are other elements of sustainability, which we were not going to do. That's just something we have had an ongoing commitment towards. We will continue doing that. The good thing about this, uh, you know, the new governance and the new setup of the company is that we have actually committed that we will spend around 250 million Danish kroners over the course of these five years to not only add the right resources across the company, so increase competencies where we don't have, uh, but also support projects that needs to drive these changes. And also, specifically when it comes to reducing emissions, uh, move away from fossil-based to renewable sources. Then I have to go back to the users, bring you back to who are the people we're actually working for. The thing is, in a medical device company, we are a very, you could say, heavily regulated company. So we need to have certain priorities very clear. Product safety, clinical performance. Use, uh, you could say, easy to use products or safety for the users, that's key. We cannot compromise on that. But then how do we, you know, when we were making the strategy process, we were also thinking, how do we actually make this easier for our users? 
what do we provide to the users that actually they can feel that they're contributing to this journey or this movement? So this strategy period, we will focus on identifying new materials, so new alternative materials, also support the you know, new recycling technologies, the development of new recycling technologies, and then partnerships. That's the key. I mean, I'm really happy to be in, in a panel like here where we get to meet fellow people who are working with sustainability and then talk about partnerships. I'll take you through a few things that we're doing, and this is where I can talk about what you said, Phil, about increasing and reducing. So this slide is a lot about increasing. So when we are trying to make products for our users, that is about, you know, how do we improve these products that's actually supporting the sustainability aspect of the products? We want to increase the amount of renewable materials we use in the products. So it's really increasing the amount of recycled content in our packaging, uh, using bio-based material in our packaging. Um, and then also we want to design our products, at least a huge part of our legacy products, in such a way that the packaging is recyclable. So almost 90% of our packaging should be recyclable, which means when our users do get the products, they have the possibility of recycling the packaging. So converting, again, as I said, to renewable materials, or currently we have, you know, multi-layer polymers, so try and make it or design it in such a way that it should be single layer. And I want to be very clear when I say packaging out here, most people assume it's the, the boxes in which your products come in. But that's what we call tertiary or secondary packaging, and that's already made of cardboard, which is a renewable source. What we are focusing on is primary packaging, which is actually a part of the product. It actually helps keep the sterile barrier of the product. So when we want to change that, it really means redesigning the product. And uh, this is where we use the eco-design principles in how we are designing products. Even in our pipeline, you know, in our innovation pipeline, we are constantly looking at eco-design and trying to embed it. So less material, more renewable material, less waste, and of course, anything that contributes to less climate change. The other part of this is our production waste. So when you make, you could say, physical medical devices, there is bound to be some amount of medical, or you could say, production waste that happens. And here, actually, we set a target last year that we wanted to recycle 50% of our production waste. We already met that target <laughs> last quarter because we did find a partnership where <clears throat> we met with uh, a certain supplier that could actually help us with downcycling you know, mixing our uh, production waste with rubber materials and creating floor grounds for kindergartens and play, play areas. So now we are working on upgrading this target, and uh, when we launch our new sustainability report in October or November, that's when you will be able to see the new target as well. That's what we're doing to increase, <laughs> I would say. Then comes what we're doing to reduce. So, of course, emissions and climate action, that is the key. Everyone's talking about it. We just had the new IPCC report, so we know it's the thing. So last year, we committed to the business ambition for 1.5 degrees, which is basically the future we would like to see in the, based on the Paris Agreement. And we already have some targets that we have set up. Uh, so from our own production, we want to be a carbon neutral production. So we want to move towards 100% renewable energy, so that's not just electricity, but also phasing out the use of natural gas. So we use natural gas in our heating, and that's where we have actually committed some money to, to phase that out. So move towards either electric heat pumps or go for a biogas sort of sourced gas. Um, that's what we're doing in our own production. But then there's a lot, you could say, in our value chain emissions that we are looking at. Uh, some of it is, of course, uh, to do with, you know, how, what kind of business travel that we do, how do we send our products, you know, how do we reduce air fried, we want to move towards electric vehicles and so on. But the key part that we have found is actually emissions from all the raw materials that we buy. So that's where we've, uh, this is, I would say, the partnership with our suppliers comes into play. Uh, and that's, uh, so we have set up a sustainable supplier program within the company, which means we are evaluating all our suppliers. And uh, that's also another program that we will keep updating on and how we will actually, let's say, start the right dialogues with our suppliers to reduce emissions.
Then I think I will just take uh, um, a, a bit to talk about the whole inward outward approach. So yes, we have top management commitment when it comes to this new strategy. But then as I mentioned, we're around 13, 14,000 employees and everyone has to feel that they're, they're part of it. So there's a lot of work that we're doing internally to increase engagement. Actually, when we also did the strategy work, we did do an entire idea campaign internally in the organization to sort of ask, what are your feelings? What are your thoughts? What kind of ideas do you have to all the employees and see if we could actually include that in our strategic ambitions? So that is one thing that we are doing, drive internal engagement to help us also achieve our milestones. But then there's also a lot that we do externally as well, so outward. Um, the key part is actually, I would say, very much with our users and also healthcare professionals because they are the ones also who actually use our products. So we do a lot to raise the standard of care over there. Uh, we've done a lot to sort of increase the, you could say, the type of funding that our users get through reimbursement schemes, which are not present in many countries, but we've actually done that now in Japan, in, in Korea, and Australia. Um, we also do a lot of awareness programs. We have an entire Coloplast professional and Coloplast care uh, program, which is actually about increasing awareness for all the healthcare professionals, all the users, and we will integrate sustainability as well in that. Uh, we've made several alliances like this. So this is partnerships is the key, or you could say what we are focusing on to, in order to create an external engagement as well. If you want to read more about us, we are on our corporate website, so please go there and have a look at our journey. Or rather, I would say, please join the movement and uh, be together with us because there's a lot of things we would like to do. And uh, five years is a very short time. So <laughs> we will we'll work hard on that. Yes, that was, uh, that was it for me. Thank you very much, everyone. And we're back. Thanks very much, Nasera. Lovely stuff. There's lots to chew on in there. I was uh, particularly uh, interested to hear about partnerships and the inward and outward uh, and some of the things we mentioned earlier as well. Um, this is a moment where I'd like to bring in all our panellists and also be able to introduce Anna Jensen, who has joined us as well. Hi, Anna. Hi. Let me give you a little introduction to Anna as well, as I did with Michael and Nasera. So, uh, Anna, you're the, you're the head of sustainability at Danish Football Club AKF, which is Aarhus, my home city, actually, if anybody would like to know that. Um, with more than 10 years of experience in the festival industry, uh, you were hired to jumpstart an environmental strategy for the football club in 2020. In less than a year, the club now gets 100% of its energy from renewable energy, I understand, and has become a signatory of the UN Sports for Climate Action, um, which, if you don't know, is a pretty big deal. <laughs> OK, Anna, it's great you could join us as well. Thanks for rushing from the train. So good to have you. And perfect timing, because we're just about to get into our first panel discussion. We just heard a keynote from Nasera, and I, I, I have a question. I think, Nasera, I'll start with yourself, given it was the, uh, the presentation you gave. Um, lots of interesting things to bring out there. I'm curious, when can a brand or, or an organization actually say they are sustainable? <laughs> I think, uh, Phil, I'll be very honest here, and I know we've been talking about it a little earlier as well. <laughs> it's a journey. So I, I think there are milestones to achieve, but I really don't know if I want to use the term uh, a company or a brand is sustainable. Um, definitely when you do meet certain milestones, it's a good place to celebrate that by saying, yes, this was part of our sustainability journey and here we have achieved that. That also creates uh, a lot of, you could say, encouragement and passion for the people who've been working for it. Not just myself, but let's say now in, in Coloplast as an example, it's all the employees that they feel passionate. Um, 
But I would say as long as we are keeping up with what is needed to be done, and also <laughs> looking at what more can we do, then you could say we're on the right track of being sustainable, if that is a good answer for you. It sounds <laughs> interesting. I don't think there's a right answer. I'm yes. really curious as to what you think. Michael, what about yourself? Yeah, it's a good point, Phil. And definitely, as you also add in there, there is a maybe a need for change in mindset. You talk to it also with the level of governance you now have in Kotoplast in the organization, right? And Phil, back to the point of being not just reductive in what we want to do, but try and explore in new areas as well. So for us, at least at Poboco, the idea of having a goal is, like you say, more of a milestone. The idea of a goal is something that is quickly becoming perhaps a bit outdated because you're never really truly at the end of your sustainability journey. You're just taking over the next stage of it. So you can break it down into bite-sized bits, sure, but you need to keep innovating. You need to keep pushing yourself and your collaborators as well and across your entire community. What, what do you find in the sports world or the football world, Anna? What have you... Uh, what it, where, where, when do you say you're a sustainable football club or sports club or sports entity? Um, well, I agree. That's a difficult term to use at all. Uh, however, I think there is often a question of me coming also from the festival industry. There's, is it sustainable at all to be having a festival? And that's just a, that's like a non-question because we do have festivals, we do have businesses, we do have football clubs, and I don't think the answer is that we shouldn't have our businesses or or have our clubs or football clubs or whatever. But we should try and improve, definitely, and we should uh, be on this journey. And I totally agree. It's 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 not a question of are you sustainable. It's a question of do you know what you're doing? Are you trying to improve? And what are you looking at uh, in the future? So it's actually reflecting on, on, on the possibilities, both of yourself, but also what you can do is, is what I'm hearing. I'm, I'm going to flip it around now and ask that. Uh, you, so we're talking about the when can you say sust you're sustainable or the reflections on that. What about the start point? At what point did your organizations recognize that they needed to be more sustainable or to even infuse sustainability in. I'm guessing, without wanting to, to put answers in your mouths, that the, the beginnings are different in different industries and in different companies. And, and I, I'm interested to hear, if you can remember, <laughs> what it was like when you first started, when you first had the idea. Michael, maybe. Yeah, sure. Glad to start there. I mean, the, the, the easy answer for a fairly young innovation company of about seven years is to say at the inception. But I think that might be a bit of a misnomer here because it's really only at the inception of where you start working with all the elements within your chain of your partnerships. So who are the users? Who are the uh, reclaimers of the things that you're putting into the world? And when you start getting that feedback, you start building within your mind and within your organization a better understanding of what are the challenges that we're facing? How complex are they really? And when you can break that down into every stage of the product's life cycle, which is something important in packaging at least, that's when you can start becoming sustainable. Because now you need to know what you have to not overcome, but work to create either a new path towards or create perhaps a new design profile. How do you create a product that fits into the systems of today and design it for tomorrow as well? So you have to take that into account when you start calling yourself sustainable seeking, at least. Very interesting. Nasera, Anna, what do you find as well? What's your experience? Well, I can say I can at least remember when we started because it's <laughs> not that long ago. <laughs> but was that the first definitive moment? Was there nothing before that? There was uh, a work with what you could call social sustainability, but the en environmental part was was not uh, that present in the company. And I can say that uh, it's it, that's how it is in the sports industry, or at least in the football industry, at least in Denmark so far. Uh, it's very new. So you could say that this industry may be a little bit late to the party, but uh, we're getting there now. Uh, and I can see that uh, also especially abroad, I think in the UK and in Germany, there are lots of things going on in, in the Premier League and the Bundesliga uh, where you can see things really taking off. And I think our club having signed the UN Sports for Climate Action is really a sign that, okay, we can also unite 
uh, across borders. We should look abroad to see what's there to be inspired by. And uh, but yeah, we're a year and a half in into this uh, journey. Very fresh. We'll come back and uh, talk about that a little bit later. How about yourself, Ms. Sarah? Just before we wrap up for the next. I'm going to be a little provocative and say, well, you know, this is um, what is really sustainability. You know, that's what I'm going to start with, <laughs> because every time. What I also hear you and uh, that no, there's nothing wrong with that, but it, you know everyone's thinking environmental improvements is sustainability, which is not wrong, but there's also something about, as you said, the social impact as well. I mean, I think that is also the use and need as well that you said, Michael. That's the key part where a company like Coloplast also started off with. It's a use and need that they were trying to solve. So, uh, and sustainability or sustainable is about finding that kind of a lifestyle, right, for us and also for the planet. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, um, from a Coloplast perspective, we started several years ago, uh, you know, I would say from the conception of the company as well. Yeah. Uh, but of course, there's been much more highlight in the, in the recent years on knowing that we have a boundary to work with. Uh, if we want to have a a comfortable lifestyle, whether it's us or users or anyone, we also have certain planetary boundaries that we have to adhere to. Uh, and thereby, I would say that's why you have a lot of action that's happening these days and uh, you could say a stronger governance around it as well that's working around. Really interesting stuff. I'd like to unpack a little bit of that further, but first I'd like us to take a little pause, um, save the energy for our next session. Um, Speaking of change in industries, Pangaea is a material science company on a mission to save our environment. In fact, they actively say in their branding, we are starting a movement designing a better future, which is pretty fitting for our broadcast today. So we caught up with Kerry Huang, chief of staff to, the, to their brand and impact SVP to find out just a little bit more. Uh, my name is Carrie Huang. I'm Chief of Staff to the Brand and Impact SVP at Pingaya. Um, and excited to be here. So Pingaya, what we call ourselves, um, is a direct-to-consumer material science company. And what that means is we bring different types of textile innovations as well as patents to the world through everyday products. So for example, we have a product coming out that's made out of fruit and plant fiber out of banana and pineapple leaves and using that in fibers of fruits to replace cotton. Um, and our mission essentially is to introduce these new technologies to showcase to the consumer as well as the industry that you can choose more sustainable alternatives. Um, and ultimately, hopefully we will be an earth positive company in the next few years. I'd say Pingaya was born out of the idea to be impact oriented and to give back essentially more than we take from the earth. And so our team is solely driven by the mission to prove that sustainability can be cool and widely adopted. Um, and at its core, I mean, a lot of people actually don't pronounce the name correctly, but pan means all inclusive um, in terms of continent, people, race, religion. And Gaia means Mother Earth. So we hope to have this mission of communicating that we're all inclusive um, and that we want to be a sustainable company. Um, something that's interesting is that our logo is actually made of seven different circles and each represents, um, for example, an impact pillar that we have. So a lot of this guides how we communicate and think about impact. Um, another element is that we always talk about this triangle of design, purpose and innovation. So in every department, when we're working on a product or designing and merchandising, or whether it's an R&D and they're looking for the next innovation, they think about how can we design minimally and in the most sustainable way. Um, you'll see that a lot of our products don't have frills or our hoodies don't have those strings because we think that's not necessary and let's keep it as simple as possible. Um, also trying to look into how we can design better for circularity. And then ultimately, when we think of new innovations or new categories, what is the purpose behind it? We always want to introduce it so it solves something, whether in carbon or in other pieces of climate. Um, and then the last piece in innovation is, you know, we want something that's new and different and really adds value that you can actually use science um, to make a better difference in the world in fashion. Uh, 
but we have this um, product text block that we call it on all of our products. And it's two, two, one to two sentences that explains what the product is made of. It's made out of organic cotton using less water, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, it's kind of like an analogy to the food industry. You want to re be able to read on the nutrition label really quickly what's in your clothes, in your food. So why can't we do that also with apparel? I think there's two ways we've looked at it. One is obviously because we sell directly to consumers, we really want to shift how they think about sustainability. One of the quotes we talked a lot about um, at Global Fashion Agenda, which is a nonprofit focused on sustainability and fashion, is if you can change fashion, then you can change anything. Um, and I would say that Pigai is more of a material science company that does way more than just clothing and, and fashion. Um, but I really like that quote because it shows if you can push consumers to think differently and see that there are more sustainable alternatives in what they wear and in what seems to be cool, then you can change so much more. But I would also say that another goal is to push the industry to do better um, because there's so much more that needs to be done and, and that's the biggest step change. Um, and so we've talked a lot with different brands and other partners and we're building out a B2B arm to provide more sustainable solutions that they can also use in their products. Um, but I think it's exciting to say, hey, look, there are innovations out there. Like, what else can you guys come up with um, to make the world a better place? I think the first step is being open and honest. Um, we're all trying to, to do better and do good, and no one has the perfect 100% sustainable solution. Um, so it's being open about, you know, what are we good at or what are we really working on at? So for us, it's always about communicating optimism in solutions that we have and the exciting products behind it. But also, you know, we don't have a fully 100% by whatever solution at the moment we're working on it. So I think that's something that we like to talk about. Um, other thing I think is living and breathing it, not just communicating it so that your employees also are proud of it. And when they talk to other people, they're like, yeah, we're, you know, we're really powering this mission. So one example is um, in each department, what we're trying to do is think more about how you can integrate impact either through KPIs, through whatever metrics. So even if someone is in you know design and most of the time they're working on different layouts for your clothing they still think about okay how can we make sure it's more sustainable and that goes all the way through the whole supply chain and go to market line um and i think you've you know some other companies have done a great job just to to call them out is Allbirds. they for example listed carbon calories on most of their shoe products um to indicate you know this is the amount of carbon that was used to, to create this product and we're trying to be better um, and they've also sent a note to the industry to say hey we'd love to share some of this proprietary information so that you can also be more sustainable so i think little actions like that that isn't just advertising but just as little actions that really matter and i think action speaks more than words um, so proving it out in different ways can can really make your communication more genuine because it, it truly is genuine I would say there's a couple first steps is one internally the leadership really has to buy into it otherwise none of the team will so i think it's important that they set the standard and say you know of our five priorities this year what sustainability is one of them so that everyone knows that they're championing it second is of course tactically doing an lca life cycle assessment across all products or services that you have so you understand the baseline and see what to work on and then the third is being open and just saying, this is where we are right now. We want to do better, but the, and we're not there yet, but this is our plan. Other companies like Gani, they on their, their website, they just write, we're not a sustainable company. And then they talk about all the reasons why they're not to the point they want to be. So I think that's a great first step is just being open and communicating and, and telling the world where you are right now. Thanks very much to Kerry for joining us there. And actually, Kerry talked about openness and honesty from brands about uh, where they're at with sustainability in their journey now. And I'd love to turn to the panel who's with me again today. Hello. Um, we enjoyed that, I think. And I, I, it feels like there's a vulnerability, if you like, in saying you need to be more sustainable or to do more or you're not doing enough. 
Has that ever come up in Pavoco's journey, Michael? Definitely. Um, we pride ourselves by having a pretty clear idea of what we want to do in time. We want to be 100% bio-based. We want to be fully recyclable within the paper stream. And I can say that even with the product we have today, we're not there yet because we're part of taking an innovation journey together with the companies that we work with. And we try to be very upfront about that, saying we are early in our journey as well. We're trying to create something new, something that doesn't have a guidebook. So we want to be very upfront about where are the sore spots and where do we want to engage people from our community and from other levels of industry, even the users or the recyclers in our process. So it's not so much just being vulnerable, it's also open up for invitation. If you are honest about where your vulnerabilities are, and you're early in the journey, you invite people to go along with you. And, and you mentioned that you've been very early right now in your industry, a year and a half before starting yes. the path of sustainability. So you must meet some of these challenges as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it was actually part of our initial um, communication about it that we wanted to do the little steps that we were able to do from the beginning and then get smarter, get more information on what are the next right steps to be taking. Uh, so we we're very honest about that we don't know everything. We are in the start of our journey and we want to be uh, get get more information, become smarter in our in our journey, what we where we're going to know more about what will be the next right step. Uh, but I think that's that it takes some uh, courage as well, right? For you as well, uh, to open up and say we don't know exactly where we're going, but we want to do this. Because you also open yourself up to criticism when you, when you say that this is not perfect, but we want to get there. No, definitely. A criticism, I think, is one part of it. Whenever we talk about making or impacting change, criticism is a natural part of that because we are exploring into a new field and there are some necessities for any industry that will always be in place. A product needs to be always used and we as humans are part of consumption within the world. So, like you say, and there's some non-starter questions. Why do we have festivals? Well, that's not an interesting question. The interesting question is how can we elaborate on the products that we will always need? Packaging or med tech devices. Um, if I can just uh, crack an internal joke that we have in the company. We're called Coloplast. We use plastic for our products. <laughs> and uh, so, and again, back to we cannot completely move away from it because our users really need these products. But we have to acknowledge that, <laughs> that you know, we're still using virgin plastic for majority of our things. So, uh, and this has been very honestly, has been shared with everyone saying that that is the reality of it. We also know that uh, our users need the products. So where do we focus? How do we start to make this change? Uh, packaging is of course the first thing that we had to focus on. That's that's a clear, uh, you could say, uh, direction we had to take. So that's where we're focusing on. But uh, there's a lot more, <laughs> given that we are still coloplast. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious how the, this vulnerability could be quite overwhelming in some ways, especially for your users, but also you're a very large company. Was it 13,000 people, maybe more? Um, that could be a little bit overwhelming to hear that there's more to be done. Um, how do you how do you counter that? How do you get people, whether it's a movement inwards or outwards or, or both, how do you get people on board with that? I think, um, so as I said, I've, I've been here for a year now, but what I have observed is um, they have wanted this for quite some time already. Uh, our users have been asking for it, you know, the amount of packaging they receive, uh, whether they can do more with it. Uh, I mean, these are people with intimate healthcare needs and they want to work with sustainability or they want to do something. Uh, then, of course, we have a responsibility. We have to do something for that. And then uh, having talked to the number of people that I have now talked to during these corona times, you know, <laughs> being able to go to office and actually talk and meet people, each and every one of them has said, what can we do in a, in a smart way as well? Because, and I use the word smart because designing these products it takes, I mean, since we are in a design setting here, so it's, it's important to mention that. It's quite, it's not straightforward because you have to keep in mind that the human body is different, you know, you're catering for things like that. So um, it's, it's been like people have really gotten creative in how do we do things. So I think that is, uh, yeah, 
it's been, if that answers the question, that it, that's what's been driving us in that way. It feels like there's a, a real kind of everyone's ready to roll their sleeves up and, yes, and start yes, trying to do something. Yes, that's the feeling I've been getting. What about football fans then, Anna? I mean, it would be, it would be an unfair assumption to say football fans, you know, do, would they care about sustainability? My guessing is they're all quite young and they really care. Well, you're on the right track, I think, because it's a very normal, I should say, assumption uh, that football fans, do they even care? I don't think so. But, but the reality is that, well, at least in Denmark, most of us are football fans or football interested or ha have kids that, are, that, are, that play football or whatever. So, so many people are involved with football. And to say that they shouldn't be interested or care about uh, the environment or sustainability would just be, it's, it's, it's false. It's simply, it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it's old school maybe. I think it's, it's at least not right. Old school narrative. Just old school narrative, Something that's yeah. been drummed into us. Yeah, 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 kind of saying that it's a niche, that you can say something very specific about that these, ki these people do not care about environmental uh, stuff. It's not right because it's so many people. You can't say anything, uh, any one thing that is true about them. So, and at least also what I've experienced during this last year is that uh, our fans, our community is interested and is engaged and do want to do good. It's not, maybe they don't know what to do, but then they look partly to the football club to say, okay, what can we do together? So uh, that's just picking that up. But that I think is a really interesting point coming from both sides here, that there is such a level of caring and involvement and from inside and outside the organization to know what do we need to do or what can we do. And showing vulnerability is a call to action in that regard. It is not in the past to put yourself just to critical acclaim, but it also helps to involve partners that you might not be aware are within your organization or external to it as well. True. Mm -hmm. When you can start I talking about it, you open yourself up yeah. for, the, for the discussion. Can I just say, I'm s really curious, <laughs> <laughs> being a sports fan myself, uh, yes. can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you're doing or, you know, the steps that you've started or initiated? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the steps that we did from the beginning was changing to 100% um, renewable energy as a, as a power um, source. That was one thing. That's actually quite easy that's maybe mm. one of the few low hang low hanging fruits that we talk about all the time then we um started a uh, waste uh, separation program within the stadium so coming to the football game you're asked to to sort the waste on the way out mm. uh in four different um types of waste mm. and uh we changed the jersey to one made of recycled polyester because you know sports jerseys, jerseys are from polyester, but we changed it into 100% recycled, and I think that's something that we'll we'll see a lot more of because that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. uh, what else did we do? Then we have um, changed some of our cars into electric cars and hybrid cars, and we are installing um, what is that called when you have your power from uh, for your car. Your chargers, mm. yeah, <laughs> installing chargers in our, in our parking lot uh, very soon. So those are some of the, it seems like obvious things, yes. but you have to kind of start doing them, yes. right? Yeah. And then we are uh, right now working on, the, the, on the, the strategy plan for the coming years where we are setting more goals and we had our um, baseline measured uh, just in the winter. So that was the first way where we measured and now we want to take that further. But uh, Concrete actions, those were maybe the four main ones. It's really interesting that, you know, that you've changed the shirts, what the shirts are made of, and the fans are wearing the shirts. Exactly. You know? So actually, the, it, it's directly influencing the community. Yeah. I'd like to pause again. Sorry, I know we're just getting going, <laughs> but I've got a lot to fit in today. Um, okay, let's take a moment to hear from the Index Project now, who, of course, are co-running this broadcast with Designer as well. Uh, the Index Project having their ninth cycle of the Index Awards next month. The biannual prize, which has been running since 2005, awards five different designs within the categories body, home, work, play and learning, and community. We mentioned earlier Poboco is a finalist, isn't it, Michael? Exactly, yeah. We're rooting, nice we're rooting for you. Um, so here's CEO Lisa Chung to give you an introduction to the finalists 
in the work category. Let's take a look. Our mission at the Index Project is to mobilise and promote designs that improve life for people all over the world. We do this partly through the Index Award, a biennale that we're celebrating for the ninth time this year. This year, we have nine finalists in the running for the Work Category Prize. To date, we see ingenious designs addressing the same issues that we've seen a decade ago. Meanwhile, others are addressing challenges that we're only just starting to grasp. From the very tangible and practical to online systems and future thinking, here are some incredible designs you get to discover. This is Biome who grow environmentally regenerative and natural insulation from mycelium. Sustainable farming has long waited for an impactful solution to manage weed, and this is where the farm droid FD20 comes in. Potrero Digital is a network of digital trade schools aiming to include, educate and support low resource people over the age of 16. Reglove is a smart system that produces recyclable single-use gloves as an alternative to disposable plastic gloves. Sahat Kahani is a health tech company aiming to democratize health. They're not only making healthcare more accessible, but also creating an all-female network of doctors. Even the world might be tired of Zoom calls, Spatial has found a way to make it more fun and encouraging for collaboration through truly unique virtual spaces. The Tembu platform was built for community members to view, analyze, and generate insights from the collected environmental data on the platform. The Billy system is the first garment recycling plant in Hong Kong, helping brands and organizations revive excess inventory, unused raw materials, or textile waste. Lastly, we have the X-Vision spine system, an AR navigation system enabling surgeons to visualize patient spinal systems in 3D and do surgery while looking at the patient and not on the screen. Thank you for listening in on these solutions. We hope that you gain some insights and inspirations to help you on your sustainability journey. If you want to discover more, go to our website, the index project forward slash award. Thank you. Good luck to all the finalists. 30th of September is when the winners are announced. There'll be a digital live stream of it for you to catch as well. So keep an eye on the Index Project's social media uh, for more about that. So from awards, we'll now take a leap to social justice. Wael Ashawaf's company, Rights, is out to help people know and protect their rights. The company's innovation has also been recognised as one of Fast Company's world-changing ideas. So I can't wait to see this. Here he explains the thinking behind the company, what it sets out to achieve, and how it came about with sustainability at the heart of it. My name is Wael Ashwaf, and I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Rights. Rights, the word rights comes from two words, rights as in your civil rights and human rights, and the word I, which is eyewitness, being an eyewitness to authority and holding people accountable. And rights is basically a mobile platform that helps people know their rights, protect their rights, and then take action on causes uh, they, care, they care about. Our core mission really is to help people get equal access to justice and accelerate the rate at which uh, social change and, and positive change occurs. And to do that, we, our values are really simple. One, we put the people first. So we try to take care of the people before we ask for anything or, or, or help. They're at the center of what we do. And uh, secondly, uh, we embrace innovation to achieve change. So far, it's been uh, purely organic, uh, but our strategy is to basically partner with grassroots organizations that already have an audience. Uh, the second thing we're going to start doing is working with micro influencers uh, that can reach out to their audiences as well and help us amplify. 
And third, which is really important to us, is uh, building this campus ambassador program. So students are very active, especially Gen Z. You have over 70% that have participated in some kind of protest in the US, 80% support Black Lives Matter movement. So they're very active compared to uh, other segments. Practicing what you're preaching is really important if you're creating impact. So for us as a company, we talk about this all the time. Uh, it starts internally. We really embrace uh, diversity, thinking about our policies, how we have more diverse leadership within our team and inclusive leadership. Uh, the other thing is for us to be connected to the actual people that we're serving, our customers and the people that need our help. And to that end, we brought on a chief justice officer. Uh, his name is Justin Moore as a partner. And he is a civil rights attorney, so he helps us stay focused on actually ensuring the technology we're building has a connection to the change that's happening uh, on the ground. We find issues, like there are the big issues everyone hears about, you know, like uh, George Floyd, everyone knows that name. But there are literally thousands and thousands of other smaller causes that just don't get heard because those people don't have access to resources or they don't know how to amplify their voices. So we actively seek those out and try to highlight them to help them uh, get justice and get the help they need. Have an intention and make a decision to make this part of the DNA of the company. Uh, it's not enough to just do this as something you do as a one-off exercise or uh, just set aside some money and do it once and, and move along. So that means thinking how to create authentic change. Uh, a lot of the criticism that we're hearing on the market is that employees and customers feel a disconnect between what companies say they want to do and what they stand for and what they actually do. Right? And I saw a really interesting post the other day that said, don't show me uh, your mission statement and your value statement. Show me your employment numbers. Show me your wage discrepancy. Show me your, your data, like the information, right? Uh, so I think that's really important uh, for companies uh, to, to be authentic uh, and do that. People always think the leader is the most important part of a movement when it's actually the first follower. And if you think about it, when there's a leader in the beginning doing something new, you're often doing it and people are looking at you like, is this even gonna work? They don't believe in you yet. It's not until the first follower comes and has faith in that leader and then publicly shows people that they're following and supporting that leader that makes it easier for the second follower and the third. And soon you have a, this movement because you people are seeing the followers uh, following you. So. Uh, if you find someone that has a good cause, you supporting them as a first follower is just as important as the leader taking the lead. So I encourage you to support the smaller voices. So I think uh, you need to be very thoughtful in how you do it. And there's uh, one uh, incident that happened to me that really made, made me realize this. And it's around having a strategy. So uh, my son has a Rubik's Cube and he's 12 and he could solve the puzzle really quick. In about a minute, he solves the puzzle. I can't solve the puzzle even if I spent an hour on this thing. So I asked him, how come you can solve it so easily? And he said, dad, I have a strategy. I know the strategy. And so in the same way, we all may be working really hard to solve a problem, but if we don't understand the strategy, then we're not gonna be effective. And so that's part of like the idea of like building rights is to offer people that strategy so that their work and effort can be effective. I can break it down into four steps. First step uh, is just grab these four people in your company, have your decision maker, CEO, someone from sales and marketing, someone from HR and someone from operations and discuss with them what is important to their stakeholders. So your employees, your customers, and to the company. Uh, then second, have them go back, talk to those people and come back, 
out with some low hanging fruit to implement. Uh, and then just choose the simplest thing that your company can implement. It could be as simple as like giving a day for volunteerism to your employees. Uh, and then third, measure it. And lastly, celebrate the wins publicly so that your employees can see that uh, it matters, your customers can see it matters, and you can create the cycle. Thanks very much, Wail, and thanks to all of you for writing in with your comments and questions from all around the world. We see you. And uh, there's still a chance to enter some questions and comments there. We're going to come to them soon. But before we do, panel, I'd love to come back to you because Wael talked about practicing what you preach and, and there being a gap between what companies say their uh, intentions are and what they are actually doing. And it kind of, I'm curious about what, whose responsibility is it to lead, actually? Because it seems in some ways uh, consumers are driving the urgency and pressing big organizations to change. Um, but there's also change happening from the top. So actually, in your view, whose responsibility is it to lead? Maybe, Nasera, you can start. I mean, I mean, there's no clear, you could say, this is the right way. Uh, of course, I think having... Uh, top management uh, dedication and interest is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that's my view. I really think uh, because they're also the top people who are deciding the strategy of the company and they're responsible for it. So it's important that they are invested completely in that. Um, then, of course, having said that, Coloplast is also a listed company. So, of course, investors are also driving. Uh, and I do believe it's very important that investors also take keen interest in this because... Uh, T till today, everyone's, you know, investors have always been interested in can we make the money, <laughs> but then they're working with finite resources, so they ought to understand that, uh, that, you know, it's in their interest as well. So we've seen that a lot of movement from the investor community. Uh, in the last few years, we've had so many questions from them asking us about the action that we have committed that we're going to take and what are we doing, so how are we progressing as well. So that's also quite an important, I would say, they're the ones driving it but it's everyone's responsibility in the end, yeah. Do you find that they'd hold back their investment if, uh, if you didn't show your sustainability ambitions? I think so far, uh, on, on certain elements which are easy to measure, because that's also one of the difficulties with sustainability, it, measuring sustainability in the right way. Uh, you know, climate action, yes, we have a whole methodology, and, and still it is not, you know, it is a very vast, so there's a lot of changes happening in that. So I think the amount at which they have understood, yes, they have, they have been uh, asking and they have been also saying they choose to then invest because mm -hmm. of that reason. Um, but it's increasing. Uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, I know, for example, BlackRock has uh, committed to. Uh, we, we are also committed to what we call this task force on climate-related financial disclosures. Okay. So it's really about understanding um, our sustainability performance, but also how does that impact our financial performance. So that is also what I know investors are interested in, and they will be making decisions based on that. Super to know. Michael, what's your, whose who's responsibility to lead from your point of view? So it's interesting, Sarah, that you mentioned governance, because we actually have a situation within our company where we've been able to impact our governance from the ground up by making external commitments. Um, not everyone might know this, but Poboco works within a community. Uh, Phil, you mentioned Coca-Cola and I believe L'Oreal at the start. Mm -hmm. Also included here is the Absolute Company and uh, Procter & Gamble and a long-standing member Carlsberg. What we did was, together with this community, all commit to the same vision of what we wanted the future packaging to be, at least for the members working within this group. And that allowed every single member to go back to their own organization and apply that vision to their own governance structure. So by that way, we made an external commitment, took it with us back home, and then anchored that within ourselves. So you can have a couple of passionate change makers, really, within the organization impacting the governance directly. So it's a two-way street, I would say, for us. You need the passionate policy makers within their sustainability departments, and you need the governance to listen and be aware that there is a changing industry beneath them as well. It must feel a little bit the same for yourself, Anna. There's a changing industry in terms of the sports industry, but football in particular. Like, who do you think shoulders the responsibility there, or who feels that they should shoulder the responsibility? 
Well, I think at this point, it's almost everyone's responsibility, right? But um, I think also with a, with a um, well, football means so much to, to people, right? We just talked about passion and community and uh, emotions. And I think when you have that kind of passionate community around you and you mean so much to people, a lot of people, um, then you also have a responsibility, right? So it, with, a, with a, 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 a big platform, also a, a big uh, voice into the community, I think there comes a uh, responsibility to use that uh, right. And then what is right? Uh, I'm not sure, but at least to, to also um, try and inspire and, um, and maybe impact on something else than, than what is may be seen as the core, which is the football in our case. Mm -hmm. But I think once you have so many people committed to what you do, support, and, and they stay loyal through also hard times, I think uh, you also have a responsibility to, uh, to use that for something else. Um, but yeah, otherwise I, I'm completely, I completely agree. We have to have a top management uh, board uh, invested in this and the strategy has to be anchored at the top. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Oh, please, Michael. Can I jump on that? Because I think there's an interesting, what I'm catching here as well, which might go across industries, is that while this may have been a reactive approach initially to a spark that came from outside, you know, our users, our consumers, what it has done is basically light a fire underneath the organization so that we now have the chance to be more proactive in setting our strategy. We don't have to just wait for the surrounding world to tell us what they expect because we now have the chance to impact it more directly ourselves before we have to get yeah, to that point. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And also because it is so complex. Mm -hmm. So so you might not know or the, the surrounding world might not know what there is to do. It's, uh, except they say, we, you, we want you to do better, but they, they can't say exactly this do this or do exactly that, we have to find out what is the next right step. So yeah, definitely this, um, this well, dialogue or this um, co collaboration to some but extent. You're, like, you're the one sort of setting the direction. Because yeah. we were just talking earlier about channeling their passion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're setting the direction so they can channel their passion in the right way. Uh, not just for the sport, but also for everything else that surrounds the sport uh, as well. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's also where the responsibility to, to make things uh, clear and visible comes in, yes. right? Uh, to make it easier to, to take part of this as well. Actually, just taking on from that, because you just mentioned clear and visible, um, one of the things that I've been feeling now working with sustainability for some, several years and also what you read in the media, what you see other people talk about, um, I think one thing we I've always stood by, if it is measured, if it's reported, then that means something is getting done. If people are just talking about it, then, then it's just, um, and I hate to use the word greenwashing, but you know, it could be more in that direction. Uh, so setting the direction and then measuring the action, I think that is also very important. And, and that is definitely, I would say, our responsibility. That's not our users or our consumers. But it is, I would say, the responsibility of the company and whoever has the role to drive that together with the company. It's very interesting. So part of taking action is actually being able to measure it and acknowledge it and yes. be able to, and build on that, of course, be able to say, okay, we have come so far. Really interesting. I, I also, I, I've got a little note here that I made for myself as well, because we, talking uh, quite intimately about your own companies and organizations, but to what extent do you feel the responsibility to, influ to influence your own sectors and industries? Um, and is there a role to play there as well, I guess? I would say definitively yes. Um, there is a role, of course, to be in some aspects, not just an ideal, but a bit of a lighthouse for those companies that are very dedicated to commit resources, to commit their vision to sustainability. Not in the fact that those companies should be applauded, but they should act perhaps as inspiration and should be accessible by other companies within the industry. Um, there is a very archaic way of thinking that's saying, if I meet a competitor of mine, I should stop talking immediately. I think we're moving beyond that point, as you, Anna, stated. It is complex. 
There is no one single solution here that we're going to come with if we don't also start talking across even competitors to create simple principles that an industry can work around. There might be an aspect of our value chain that a competitor has already resolved, and we should definitely be able to leverage that. Exactly. And I think also when it comes to suppliers, we have to be more companies asking for services, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you'll have to, then you'll be able to build a business around it, and we will get there sooner if yes. we are together in it. And, and this is maybe myself showing vulnerability as well. I mean, uh, we are a medical device company, and I think our designers and our production and you know innovation, they are experts at designing the right products. Mm -hmm. Um, but we are not material specialists, even though, yes, we have a team who are extremely, I would say, they're dedicated, they're very knowledgeable. But we need to, I mean, we can build our own competency to a certain extent, but unless we partner with, as you said, suppliers, um, maybe even, you know, associations and all competitors are linked to that, uh, we're not going to be able to find the right solutions. So uh, I, there is... In, in this sense, I think collaboration is the only way if you want to solve the bigger problem. So. Lovely. Well, I'm, I'm going to stop asking the questions myself now and actually throw out to the public who are watching as well. And we have some lovely questions coming in. I'm, I'm going to start with the first one is, how can I, as a simple employee, start the sustainable change in the company? Who would like to have a go? <laughs> I'm going to start with that, sorry, it's just because it's on my agenda and it's on my mind. Uh, I think to begin with, uh, first and foremost, I know I said, yes, top management is key responsible for setting the scene and also being invested in it. But bring yourselves right into that. So if there is a strategy, if there are milestones and ambitions, catch on to it. And you're smart enough to know what is your role in that. Um, that is one thing. But then, of course, sustainability can be also achieved in smaller actions, you know, behavior mm -hmm. changes. We're so used to, and I have to, you know, applaud you for bringing your bottle over here, your paper bottle to drink water. We're so used to just, okay, go pick up a bottle, drink that water. <laughs> God, I've got to bring it into camera now. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense otherwise. Yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it is, after all, a finalist. So it does make sense to have it with us. So I think it's just about the choices we make as individuals while we're at work, I mean, outside of work nowadays, of course, many of us are also working from home. So um, it's key about asking ourselves, like me as an employee, what do I need to do to join this movement and to contribute to this movement? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, ask the right questions as well. If you, if you find that there is something you're not happy about or you want that change, then there are platforms, reach out, uh, share, and... Uh, I would say continue asking if you're not still happy about it. So yeah. there's some action that is taken in the end. Yeah, and if I could just quickly build on that, I would also say if you have the means or if you have people around you that could also assist you in that, make it measurable. Create this benchmark that we were discussing just before to see where is our starting point. Mm. It's an easy, actionable point that you can bring into your organization. You can make it very evidently clear what is your current status, and then you can work from there with slight improvement suggestions. Just make a three-point action plan, even as a simple employee. This is something everyone can do with the field that they're really passionate or an expert in. And even if you are not, if you don't want to be the one driving the change, then be open to change your habits. Oh, I think that's, oh, that's yeah. something that you can, we can all, all think of that we have to be open to, to change our habits. Because as you say, it's, it's so deeply rooted within us. Uh, just grab the plastic bottle, or, you know, have a meeting setting that we all know. What if we could do something a little bit different? Mm. Very nice. Keep the mic up there. And I have a question for you here from the audience as well. Anna, what's your thoughts on sharing the values of inclusiveness, equality, and sustainability through the big voice football has? Yes. Um, well, I think football as such is a big platform. Of course, there are athletes and then there are the clubs. And I think these are different platforms, even though they're using or what can you say, they're partly uh, intertwined, but, but different platforms. Uh, and I think the clubs, um, as I said before, when we have this passion and this community around us, we have to be open to tap into this passion to uh, to talk about uh, sustainability, inclusiveness, 
diversity. Uh, but of course, you have to you have to find out where you're at first, right? What are the first steps that we can take, and where do you want to be at? So I think it's a very uh, it's a very important work uh, that I think is obvious to do. If it's a business, if it's a football club, um, or if it's an athlete, but but of course, athletes are a singular people also, right? Even if they have a, a strong platform, a strong wo voice, but you have to remember they're singular people first, first and foremost. Very nice, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm going to go straight on to the next question. Do B2B companies face the same needs to become more sustainable as B2C? I love the question, but I would also actually challenge it a bit and say I wouldn't put that division into place anymore. We can't really focus on ourselves as being either consumer facing or client facing. Whenever you have any position within the creation of either a product or a platform that people can be passionate about, you are part of a chain that delivers something to people. So the, the exact same expectation that should be to the customer facing side of a product should be to you as well. And there should be a very clear way of communicating with your partners around you to ensure what that expectation is. I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, I've been a student of, uh, you could say, system thinking uh, from the very beginning. That's uh, where I even started my career. So I really have to say, unless you think of yourself in a system, you know, the whole cradle to grave or the whole circular way of thinking, uh, I don't think we can make any change. Uh, singularly, we can only do as much. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're B2C or B2B. Very nice, thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm just going to ask a question of my own as well, because I'm, I'm really interested just to squeeze this in. We talk about sustainability being a, a, a long-term vision, a long-term goal, with some, in my mind, there's some short-term pressures, particularly when the IPCC released their report, uh, and we all realised, oh my goodness, you know, if we hadn't realised that already. Um, so how do you counteract that fatigue? How do you keep your momentum up and the ambitions going? Where, where do you get your energy from? As three leaders who are working directly with this, I'm really curious to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, of course, this report wasn't, it wasn't unexpected, mm. but also not very uh, positive reading. Uh, I think my motivation comes from seeing that we or that we actually do something right so to see okay this goal was met this goal was met of course and then you have to measure it also to be able to to um to communicate it but i think uh seeing that we actually move something and get some feedback that that reson that it resonates with people but um are we doing it all fast enough? No, not as a, not as a system or, or a global world, but uh, that we are doing something uh, is my motivation, at least. You could be forgiven to be anxious about it, though, as a person. Do you understand where, what I mean? Yes. yes, and the challenge, I believe, is definitely immense, no matter what part of the system you're looking at, either you're at the creation end or just as a consumer in day-to-day -day life. But I think Bayou, uh, from the interview, also had a very good point, saying, remember to celebrate the small victories. And that is such an important aspect of your outward-facing approach to whenever you get a critical question. Remember that you have celebrated small victories that got you to this point but equally for your organization at every level. Keep talking to people, figure out what is important to them, and when you resolve some of those issues, remember to celebrate them loud and you know, vividly. Um, but be aware that there is definitely still you know, an immense undertaking here, but you shouldn't stop just halfway. So I, I just want to add a point. Um, also, um, I have to say it also drives me knowing that we need to make change fast, especially when it comes to climate action. Uh, so also taking accountability for it is very important. Um, uh, nowadays, we are all talking about how somehow linking uh, climate milestones or you know, what companies want to do to remuneration. And I think that is also one of the key things that we need to focus on. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is the direction. If we take, take accountability for it, then we know we will make some action. And then eventually, the anxiousness will slowly go down. And uh, maybe we don't reach a horrible future as we can see in the IPCC report if we don't meet the targets. 
completely understand. Thank you. We'll go to one last audience question. As consumers, what are some ways we can encourage the organizations that we interact with to listen and really want to be more transparent and involved in sustainable practices? Michael, maybe you can start. Yeah. Um, first off, I got to state that keep asking critical questions. That is such an important part. If there is an area that you think that you would like to know more on, or you would like to engage with a company that works within a field that you find to be a critical aspect of this uh, journey and development we're on, keep asking those questions. And there are definitely people at the other end who are willing to talk to you about that. In terms of demanding transparency, um, I think it's also critically important that we focus our attention in the right places. And I'm going to come back to your question again, and which I've done once before, which is something like, why are there festivals? Sure, it's a good consideration, but there are festivals. We are in a world that we have created to fit the needs that we have as consumers as well. So rather than focus on those, focus on those that can enact a change. What can I do at a festival? How can I engage with it to make it a better practice as a maybe yearly occurrence? Matilda, do you have any thoughts? Um, I agree to all of that. <laughs> so <I would> <laughs> yes to all the above. Yes to all of that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I think um, staying connected um, and, and as, as you said, you know, just be part of the change. What can, again, ask yourself as an individual, what can I do? And uh, if there is a direction that has been set, how can I contribute to that direction? Sure. I think uh, that's a, ask yourself first, more than, you know, asking all others or the organization, ask yourself. That's what I would say. Okay. Do you have anything to add, Anna? No, I think we're all uh, so uh, accessible uh, all companies do listen, I think. Can we change it immediately? Maybe not. But we do listen on all uh, channels, almost, right? So, yes, keep asking the questions. And, and as consumers, in, maybe you can also vote with your money, but that's, that's an easy, um, easy answer, right? But you can always make your own choices. And, uh, and the economy is also depending on where that goes. So, mm. so that's, a, that's an option, too. It certainly feels like the authenticity of brands is there's a there's a movement towards that both being authentic but actually allowing room to be yourself as a brand as well to be honest to talk to the vulnerabilities we talked about earlier as well which in my mind can only benefit the consumers the the people who are purchasing or interacting with the thing that you make or do or the service you provide. I um, We have to wrap things up in a minute. I just want to ask you one quick question. If we were to meet in a year's time, what do you hope has happened by then? What progress have we made? Can I? <laughs> you know, even before we started this, um, I think, Michael, you and I got talking about your paper bottle and what kind of material you were using. Maybe we are already talking partnership. I don't know. I'm just trying to say you, we come back to you with some partnership uh, uh, update. Partnerships, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's music to my ears. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and just to follow on that, I mean, just conversations like the ones here today, if they can engage any member out there, they are thinking, maybe I have something to contribute to that. Maybe I could join this community and be, you know, the future recycler of paper bottles, or I could help Coloplast with some of their considerations that they have for their strategy they put to 2025. It's just a matter of reaching out and connecting and um, building the partnerships, building on the knowledge that it is a complex system that we have to tackle. Thank you. Thanks. So. That's unfortunately all we have time for. Thanks to our panel. Nazira, Michael, Anna, thank you so much. And, uh, and thanks for being here to share your thoughts on sustainable movements more than anything. And also to Kerry and Wail for joining us on video. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your perspective on the world as well. And of course, thank you to you for tuning in. It's so much appreciated and frankly wouldn't be possible without you. Uh, the questions and comments have all come in. Um, we couldn't get to them all, of course, um, because you're so positive and sharing so much, which we love. Um, but there'll be a second chance in a few weeks time on September the 8th, I believe. Don't hold me to that. When you can join the follow up Clubhouse event, which is funnily enough on Clubhouse. Um, Join us then. The details will be announced on social media as well. And you can catch the next 
broadcast session like this, uh, Designing the New Usual, which will be about diversity. That's on the 17th of November. So we have a few months to go until then. Uh, so until then, from the Index Project and from Design It, and from me, Phil, as well, thanks, and from all of us here, actually, in the broadcast world, thanks for joining. Please take care of yourself and uh, see you next time.